Good day! Today we're going to do the kombucha troubleshooting guide and this may be a lengthy presentation but at the end of this presentation you'll be able to tell when your kombucha is good at drink, when to balance the yeast and bacteria again and exactly how to do that. You will know what mold would look like or what mold looks like and how it presents itself and when to toss it out and when to save it. So this is going to boost your confidence and really put you on the right track so that you can get brewing without worrying whether it's good enough or not. So let's move on over to a balanced brew. Okay, well a balanced brew will produce a fair amount of bubbles and it will be visible when the kombucha is poured from the initial brewing vessel into a glass or into a bottle for the second fermentation. So after your first seven days you will see that there's a slight fizziness in your kombucha brew. It might not be felt by the palate but you will definitely feel the bubbliness on your tongue. It's not completely lifeless. Okay, a scoby will also form within a seven day period and the liquid will lighten and it will have a tangy taste to it. So that's all signs of a balanced brew. Back to the fizziness, if your kombucha is so fizzy that it actually produces a beer like foam, then it's also out of balance and that means that your yeast is way more active than the bacteria but that will also be coupled with a very thin scoby forming on top. So let's go straight to the most popular asked question of all time and that is the fizziness. How do I get my kombucha to be more fizzy and why is there no fizziness? So fizzy and bubbling kombucha isn't a measure of how a successful brewer you are or how successful your ferment went. So you want your yeast and bacteria to be in balance at all times and the scoby houses most of the bacteria so that's why you have to have a nice thick scoby forming on top. And then the yeast is more visible in the form of the stringiness you know that stringy brown strands that's the yeast that's floating around in the jar and when they die they will actually go and lay at the bottom of the jar and that is what forms the sediment okay so it is very common for a new kombucha brewer to experience a less fizzy or a no fizz brew with the first batch or two. After the second batch then you can expect to get a fizzier kombucha. The fizziness will improve as the yeast establishes itself. Some of the yeast are airborne and comes from the air in the environment you brew your kombucha in and sometimes it will take a while for these yeast colonies to establish themselves in the new environment. So when you move your kombucha remember that this is now a new environment where the kombucha must establish itself and that will have an impact on your fizziness and the whole character of your kombucha brew. If the season changes again you can expect changes in the character, the bubbliness, the color, the fizziness, the taste. You can experience a change in all that. So the more stable your environment, the more consistent your brew will be, your brews will be. So normally after three or four cycles of fermentation the yeast would be more established and you can expect more bubbles. A lot of the times when you experience no fizz in your brew it is because of the fact that the yeast must establish itself. So there is also ways to balance the yeast and bacteria but we'll get to that later. If you want the fizz you have to wake the yeast. Different yeast strains produce more carbon dioxide and that is what's responsible for the bubbles in the brew. So sugar is good for the yeast but remember not to add too much sugar because it can actually reduce the amount of carbon dioxide. 
Steeping the tea for longer periods of time will increase carbonation. So where weaker tea reduces the carbonation, stronger tea increases it. So, and then the ingredients you choose to make your tea with is important because certain teas like green tea and sugar, white table sugar, contributes to the carbonation factor. Temperature and time also affects carbonation. When you have no or very little fizziness, you would want to increase the ratio of yeast to acetobacteria or acetobacter bacteria populations. Here's what you can do, here's the action steps that you can take to increase or wake up the yeast. Scoop the next batch of starter from the bottom of the jar and not the top as per usual. This will definitely increase the units of yeast. Start with a 20% starter instead of the recommended 10% until your brew becomes fizzy enough. Thereafter, you can go back to the 10% starter. Okay, the other thing you can do is take your starter, pour it out three days before bottling. Okay, so you take your starter and you leave it for three days to establish the yeast and then you only make your kombucha. So say for instance, you receive the scurvy from me or you receive the scurvy with some starter liquid in it because that's how it comes you can just put it in a jar and cover the jar with a breathable cloth and leave it in the starter as is for say about three days and after that three days you just make your tea and then you only start brewing your kombucha okay that will help the yeast to establish itself quicker in the new environment so your brew will become a little bit more fizzier than it would usually with the first day ferment make your sweet tea with half the amount of sugar in the beginning and add the rest of the sugar halfway through the fermentation process Try using a mixture of black and green tea in the ratio of 3 parts green tea to 2 parts black as green tea is known to increase carbonation. Try to ferment in higher temperatures because the yeast simply loves high, high temperatures. So that can be up to 27 degrees Celsius. This you only do until you see that your kombucha have become fizzy. Thereafter brew in the normal temperature range and that is 22 degrees celsius to 24 degrees celsius because you don't want your bacteria to deteriorate too much you want the yeast and bacteria to stay in balance and just a note on the temperatures some people prefer brewing at lower temperatures that's 22 degrees celsius and are willing to sacrifice carbonation for taste then you can even get something as too much fizz, believe it or not. And too much fizz isn't really a good thing. So yes, everybody wants a fizzy ferment, but the yeast will usually become overstimulated in the warmer months because of the increased temperatures. And this usually goes hand in hand with a premature souring, a malformated or malformed scoby and low concentrations of gluconic acid in your kombucha itself. In warmer temperatures yeast respiration increases and produce three times as much carbon dioxide and almost no alcohol. In these conditions yeast also burn oxygen and glucose at higher rates. So when this happens the bacteria don't have enough alcohol to fill themselves with. This means that they must compete harder for oxygen and glucose. When there is no alcohol, the bacteria must rely on glucose and air to reproduce. But with the yeast being in respiration, there is also decreased amounts of oxygen and this causes the scoby to grow slower than usual. So that's why you get a thinner scoby when the yeast is overactive. The yeast is actually eating the bacteria's food. 
insured. We want the yeast to relax a bit so that they can use their energy for producing alcohol, which is food for the bacteria. So here's what to do. Increase the available glucose by adding all the sugar called for in the recipe with one go. Add glucose to your brew. This would be food for the bacteria right from the start. So you only really need a little bit, a half a tablespoon per quarter cup of sugar to one liter of water. So keep in mind you only need a little to jumpstart the bacteria because once the yeast work on the sugar for a day or two there will be an abundance of glucose manufactured and that happens up to around about the ninth day of fermentation. Steep your tea for a shorter period of time. The longer you steep the tea the higher the sterile compounds and sterols are used by yeast as fuel to reproduce. If sterols aren't available in the tea, the yeast must first manufacture it and this will keep it busy, therefore slowing down the reproduction process and giving the bacteria chance to keep up and remain dominant. A 10 minute steep for black tea and 5 minutes for green tea is a good way to go. If you're only using three regular sized tea bags per litre of water. Glucose can be added as an extra boost. Add two tablespoons of glucose per cup of sugar or half a tablespoon of glucose with a quarter cup of sugar per one litre of water. Keep in mind you only need a little to jump start the bacteria because once the yeast work on the sugar for a day or two there will be an abundance of glucose manufactured, typically right until day 9 of fermentation. Cloudy kombucha is yeast floating around in the jar. When the yeast isn't dense enough it doesn't sink to the bottom and this creates the cloudy effect. If your yeast grow or reproduce too quickly you will see that your kombucha look more cloudy. You will probably have an abundance in carbonation too. As time goes by the yeast will settle and the sediment forming at the bottom of your jar or at the bottom of your bottles during your second ferment will be evident of that. This is also in brewing terms known as the lease of the brew. Note, reducing the cloudiness can also weaken the taste of your kombucha. This is a normal variation and happens from time to time. So you're happy fermenter, you've reached day 7 and you taste your kombucha and it's still sweet. It's not tangy like it was a week before. Let's see what could have been the problem. First look at your scoby. If it's still growing, if you see that, okay, there's still scurvy on top, then it may be because of lower temperatures. So try and keep your ferment above at least 20 degrees Celsius. It could be that you added too much sugar or glucose. Always keep your ratios. A refrigeration can also be a cause of this. So that's why it's important to keep your scobies out of the refrigerator because this can also lead to mold growth. Eh? If you keep your culture in the fridge it can lead to mold growth. If you use too little starter in the beginning or if your starter wasn't strong enough or acidic enough it can also be the cause of the problem. If your scoby is not growing this can be because of insufficient air. Use a breathable cloth and not a solid lid. It can be because of an overworked culture. Maybe the scoby need to retire, so we're going to talk about dark scobies later on. Or you have cooked your culture. Pouring hot tea over your culture can kill it. Only use tea that's at room temperature. So that's why I when I make my tea in a pot I do it the night before and then I let it cool overnight. Usually in the morning it's cool enough can start brewing kombucha. Um, it can also be because of contaminant 
this can be because of dust odors detergents antibacterial soaps water containing chlorine and toxic chemicals tea type may be the cause an additive that inhibits the culture herbal teas with high amounts of volatile oils are not recommended for brewing and and can cause your scobies to suffocate these teas include but are not limited to sage peppermint and john's Worth, chamomile ginger tea and any type of tea that's made from a plant from the pepper tree so don't use that with your initial brew that you can only use with your second fermentation because these oils they go and lay on top of the brew and actually suffocate your scoby dog scobies the longer you ferment with the same scurvy, the darker it will get. This is because both the tannins in the tea and the yeast make it a little darker with each brewing cycle. It's fine to keep using the same culture as long as it seems to be making a good brew. But if the culture begins to shed dark, dried looking layers, it's probably time to retire it. When you brew with rooibos tea, it makes the scoby darken very very quickly so even with the first brew with the first scoby that's forming you will see that it is darker than with brewing with black or green tea green teas actually makes the whitest scobies of them all holy scoby so a lot of people are concerned and I was actually one of them when I saw that hey my scoby doesn't look like a perfectly formed pancake it's got holes everywhere and it looks like something actually ate on it so here the key is if you've got a thick scoby then it's a good sign if it's thick and it's got holes in it it's good because this actually means that you've got the perfect ratio between yeast and bacteria now the holes are formed by the carbonation so the scoby didn't have a chance to actually grow over that part where the carbonation escaped a thin hole a thin holy scoby that's something different that means that you have to rebalance your yeast and bacteria this we discussed at the too much first issue you have to put those yeasty birds to sleep they are overactive you have to reduce them and then you get something like a bumpy and lumpy scoby certain tannins in some teas cause the scoby cells to clump together and that is why you get the bumpy lumpy look this is a very very rare thing that happens and if it happens twice in a row and it is bothering you get a new brand of tea and then there's the no scurvy thing yes there's actually such a thing so you get back to your kombucha and you check on it and you see oh my goodness scurvy was supposed to form and i don't see anything and later on when you pour out the brew then you see but wait here is a scurvy but it's actually translucent so if your scurvy is clear if there is a scurvy but it's just clear that you can almost see through it like glass then you should increase the cetobacter bacteria to yeast ratio so that is also an indication that your yeast is out of whack so you have to slow down the yeast reproduction if there's absolutely no scoby it's not good because there's not much that you can do to save the situation Okay, first of all, check for vinegar eels. They are tiny little worm-like organisms and can be seen when looking at the rim of the liquid where the kombucha meets the glass. Look at it from the side and see if you can see something floating in there. It's really, you have to look closely. It's easy for the untrained eye to miss it. Or you can use a flashlight in the dark and shine it into your brew and the vinegar eels will actually swim towards the light and be visible if you spot vinegar eels in your brew then you have to start over with a new culture and new starter liquid so when this happens you have to check all your vessels 
for vinegar eels. To avoid facing this sort of thing in the future, follow these precautions. Don't use antibacterial soap to clean your brewing vessel or wash your hands with antibacterial soap before working with the scoby. Let your tea cool down to room temperature before adding the scoby and starter. Keep the kombucha away from fumes such as paint, solvents and other disturbing odors. Don't use raw apple cider vinegar to lower the pH of the kombucha. If you do, you will get vinegar eels for sure. Don't add any herbs, spices or anything else foreign unless it's known to be safe for kombucha. It's best not to add any herbs, spices or anything else foreign to the scoby or the culture. Okay, It might be a good ferment the first time you try it but there is certain things that actually gradually kill the culture over a period of time and that is ginger cinnamon and other herbs or household spices rather add the extras to the second ferment or when bottling to be safe rather use evaporated cane sugar as sugar sauce, no stevia, no xylitol or any other artificial sweetener. The sinking scoby. There is no need to worry if your scoby is floating, sinking or hanging out sideways. These are all normal variations. This happens when some scobies are denser than others depending on how much carbon dioxide is trapped between the layers. Often a sinker will make some of the best brews. So there's no need to worry whether it's floating, sinking or whatever it does, it's good. A climbing scoby. Now what happens is scoby forms on top of the kombucha. And sometimes when you have a very carbonated kombucha, then it will push the scoby to the top especially if it creates a good seal around the edges. If you notice that you have a climber, then it would be good to push the scoby down into the liquid. The scoby should be in the liquid because the bacteria can't work properly when suspended in the air, which means less acids and more alcohol. Action to take. Keep an eye on your brew so that you can push that scoby back into the liquid when it's levitating above the liquid in the jar. The scoby is the bacteria part which seals off the jar so the yeast can't breathe and have such a lot of access to the air. Now during the brewing cycle there's two types of activities going on. One is the fermentation process which is anaerobic without air and the other is respiration which is aerobic it's air being breathed and carbon dioxide being released so when the yeast are very active there's a higher level of respiration which is the breathing part going on respiration is a complex process that produces a lot of intermediate compounds one of these being citric acid and that's what's responsible for the rotten citrusy smell. So the sooner your bacteria or your scoby seals off the brew, the lesser of a chance you'll get this from happening. The brew itself, it doesn't taste good, but it's really not something to worry about because this imbalance seems to dissipate as respiration decreases. When bottled and sealed tightly, respiration is limited and almost impossible. So the nasty taste will normally be eliminated in a few weeks. Action to take when having a rotten citrusy smell. Try brewing in lower temperatures below 20 degrees Celsius. The normal ratio is between 22 and 27 degrees Celsius. Use the correct ingredient ratios. Keep your jar covered and dark away from direct light. Make sure the jars are washed and rinsed well before using. Now what to do if your second fermentation kombucha smells like stink? I've got a question once about the kombucha being lovely after the first ferment and this person flavored kombucha with pineapple for the second ferment. 
when it was time to drink it, it smelled off. And in his direct words, even though the kombucha had a wonderful taste, my nose was telling me that I was drinking liquid farts. This sometimes happens when brewing in high temperatures, especially during the summer months. The main cause of a width of sulfur is because of yeast that went through temperature abuse. It could be that the equipment wasn't washed well enough, or if soap was used, it could be that it wasn't rinsed thoroughly. It might be that the pH wasn't low enough. We want the pH to be at least between 2.5 and 3. Using juice or dried fruit with sulfur dioxide as preservative can be the cause of this stinky smell. Action to take to prevent that second fermentation stinky smell. Try brewing in temperatures below 27 degrees Celsius. Rather try and keep it between 22 to 25. Make sure the equipment, especially the second fermentation vessel, is cleaned and rinsed thoroughly. Use juice or dried fruit that doesn't contain sulfur dioxide as preservative. Your fruit may not look as bright and colorful when it's organic or preservative free, but at least you know it's good for you and the brew. Cleaning and dealing with chlorine. Things like water treatment and antibacterial soap are there to protect us from all kinds of bacteria, but we mustn't forget that kombucha is half bacteria. Chlorine and antibacterial soap kills the good and the bad bacteria. There's no way that they can know the difference between the two. These things are poison to kombucha and can make your brew taste bad or even kill the culture. A water filter designed to get rid of chlorine is a good way to go. Or you can dechlorinate your water by letting it aerate for 12 to 24 hours overnight. I no normally do it overnight. Or by boiling it to help the chlorine to evaporate. Good quality water really contributes to an excellent tasting kombucha. We ultimately want to create a bacteria friendly environment for the good bacteria and yeast to be happy and grow in the kombucha room. And then what happens is these good microorganisms, the yeast and bacteria, in turn keeps the bad bacteria out. And as the microorganisms live happily in the water and feed on the sweet tea and the sugar, the acidity level of your brew drops and keeps the brew safe. You will not be the first person that mistake the new scoby forming for mold. Sometimes scobies can look ugly and yeast may even appear as mold. It's easy to say that mold is fuzzy and that if there's no fuzz it means no mold, but sometimes it's a bit harder to distinguish between mold and a new scoby forming. It's pretty rare to get mold if you're using good cultures, the right ratio and a good starter. Here's some pictures of good healthy scobies that can be mistaken for mold growth. Here is some of mold. You get different types of mold. When inspecting for mold, look for fuzzy islands that may have formed. Fuzziness and discoloration, be it green, blue, black and sometimes pink, is clear telltale signs of mold. Notice the concentric growth pattern. Dry, fine and dusty looking green coloration fuzzy spores and small dusty islands that forms and spreading outwards. Action to take when you find mold. Dash your brew, scurvy and all and get a new starter and scurvy from your backup hub or scurvy hotel. That's why it's so important to keep backup scurvies. Remember to keep a ratio of at least 10 to 20% kombucha tea or kombucha vinegar to sweet tea when brewing. This keeps the pH low enough so that mold doesn't start forming. If you are adding enough starter and still getting mold, here's something to consider. Some people ferment a much shorter time period than others because they prefer the ferment on the sweeter side. As a result, the acidity level is not as low as it should be. This means they increase the chances of mold forming. The acidity is what actually keeps the pathogens and the mold from forming. So this means that chances of mold forming is much better. 
in an environment where the acidity level is higher. This is why it's a good idea to have a backup hub or scobio towel because the acidity tends to be lower and makes a great starter to ward off mold. The continuous brew is also a great option to go with and gives a more consistent superior brew that's less likely to develop mold. Don't brew oily herbs with your tea as the volatile oil content of the herbs affects the brew and can lead to mold. The oil floats on top of the tea and keeps the brew from breathing. Because of this, the beneficial acids don't get a chance to form and to lower the pH to keep the mold away. Certain herbs can be used but only when mixed with green or black tea at a ratio of about 12 grams of herbs per 4 liters of kombucha. Try brewing in warmer temperatures as the brew will go quicker and reduce the pH sooner. That's why we don't put the kombucha in the fridge. Keep your brew away from cigarette smoke and always keep backup scobies just for in case. Brewing in high temperatures. Temperatures that's too high aren't good for kombucha brewing. It speeds up the fermentation process and causes that not every phase of fermentation gets a proper chance to develop as it should. One can almost say that the high temperatures cause the ferment to skip a couple of steps. As with any great work of art, every brush stroke contributes to the masterpiece. The same is true with brewing kombucha. Fast forwarding the fermentation process because of high temperatures will result in an inferior brew that lacks the beneficial acids which makes kombucha so helpful to drink. In short, the higher the temperature, the faster your brew will go, the lower the beneficial acids would be, especially glucanic acids. The main concern isn't really the yeast, but rather with the bacteria, because the yeast will naturally thrive in higher temperatures and quickly knock the balance. Here's how to keep the bacteria strong in high temperatures. Use the newest SCOBY. Always use the densest, whitest SCOBY you can find because it will contain less yeast. If you have a choice, use the youngest available. Next, use the oldest, sourest starter available or use pure distilled vinegar. Most of the yeast will have died off in an old starter and none will exist in pure vinegar. This will cause the yeast to get off to an extremely slow start and allow the bacteria more opportunity to do their job. It may take your ferment twice as long but the results are much better and tastier as well. Aim for at least 7 days of fermentation. No, no matter what the temperature, the majority of acids, which are really good for us, only start to develop 7 days from fermentation. So do everything you can to slow the pace so that those beneficial acids can form before your brew are becoming too sour. This you can do by dropping the temperature or reducing the yeast populations. Use a greater surface area. Finally, use a vessel with a greater surface area and a big opening at the top. Low temperatures. Colder temperatures slows down the fermentation time dramatically and it may even take three to five weeks for the ferment to mature properly. Temperatures below 18 degrees Celsius slows down the bacteria into a slumber. The yeast also becomes lazy and produces mostly alcohol. Make sure your scoby is growing so that your brew is protected against pathogens. A growing scoby is a sign that the bacteria has enough energy to build their cellulose homes. There's different ways of eating the brew, but keep your brew out of direct light, especially direct sunlight as the UV rays will kill the microorganisms. Take care not to overheat your brew though. The temperature for brewing kombucha ranges between 21 degrees Celsius and 27 degrees Celsius but try to keep your brew between 22 to 24 degrees Celsius for the superior and more consistent brew. Heating your brew will make it go faster but faster brews isn't always better. 
If not controlled, the yeast can get out of hand and dominate over time, producing too much acetic acid, making your brew going vinegary prematurely. Temperatures at 21 degrees Celsius and above gives the brew enough time to develop and become richer in the beneficial acids, therefore aiming to get the brew to ferment over a longer period of time is always better. This doesn't mean an extremely sour or vinegary brew, but rather mean a tangy brew over a longer period of time. When heating your brew, it should be gentle and the temperatures should always be kept lower than 27 degrees. The best temperature for fermenting your kombucha is between 22 degrees Celsius and 24 degrees Celsius. This is where you'll find the best consistency and quality of kombucha. You can measure the temperature of your brew by making use of an adhesive thermometer available at brewing stores or candy thermometer. Heating your brew above 26 degrees Celsius is normally bad for the proper culture balance and development because this time to favour the yeast more than the bacteria. The yeast then grow and compete too heavily with the bacteria for food in the form of glucose. Heating your brew about 30 degrees Celsius will start killing off the bacteria over an extended period of time. Temperatures over 37 degrees will kill mostly all of the bacteria and sub yeast strains are likely to survive if anything. Here's some simple ways to keep your brew warm. And always, always be sure to monitor the temperature. The first way is to use the oven. Put your ferment into the oven and put on the oven light. Cover your brew with a big enough towel or material so the light don't penetrate the brew. Switch the oven light on and keep your kombucha there to do its fermentation magic. Make a note and put it on the on switch where you switch on the oven so that you don't put your oven on with your kombucha inside. Use a simple scarf and beanie to isolate the brew from the cold. You can even put it inside a carton box to isolate it from the cooler temperatures. A cooler box is also a good idea. A cooler box with some hot water bottles. Fill a couple of bottles with hot water and place your kombucha and hot water bottles in the cooler box for extra heat. Note, it helps to wrap your kombucha brew in a towel or scarf mentioned earlier to allow for more even heat distribution. Put your kombucha on top of the refrigerator, wrap your kombucha brew in a towel or scarf and place it on top of the refrigerator for some extra heat. You can even use reptile mats. If you really want to go all the way in, you can use a temperature controller which is available from brewing stores. This temperature control measure is a great tool to help control the temperature of your brew and puts the whole process on autopilot. Thank you for joining in on the presentation. This is Nadia Swart and I wish you a happy day. If you have any questions, please go to the